Just uh, before we begin, you saw a note um, in the bulletin today. We had a baptism at 9 a.m., which is unusual for the early service, but we encourage you to find in the pew uh, pads at the end of the pew some baptismal blessing cards that you could fill out for Charlize. Um, and uh, she um, is full of life and uh, vim and vigor, I guess is a word you don't hear anymore. But she will love your blessing, and I thank you for that. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. We all know that Jesus was a consummate storyteller. He was a playwright of sorts. In today's gospel, he invites his listeners into the theater to imagine a two-person drama that fleshes out his teachings about prayer and gratitude. He dedicates his mini-play, as he says in the opening passage, to, quote, those who are convinced of their own righteousness and despise everyone else. Well, hold on to your seats. Jesus is ready to take off as director. He describes his two characters with such color that they, are all, they all but beg us to mime these characters. Jesus' wonderfully satiric portrayal contrasts an unassailable, egotistic performer with a starkly humble petitioner. As the audience, he invites us, as always, to see ourselves in both characters, which of course we do not want to do, right? Who wants to be that one guy? We're going to talk about him in a second. Mark was talking about him earlier, right? I don't want to be that guy. But he invites us to look at this from all sides. The first he describes is a Pharisee, a member of a seriously religious group that strove to obey all of God's 613 laws. As I've said through the years, the Pharisees have a bad rap in many cases because they seriously are working to become and to be the fullest people of faith they can be. This guy, though, is different. This guy might as well introduce himself with a haughty, my name is Narcissus. According to Jesus' story, let's call him Archie, a nickname which I'm sure he would hate, took up his prayer position and prayed to himself. In case that statement didn't explain it all, Jesus quoted Archie's monologue. We can almost picture Archie there, posing as if for a mirror and imagining all the goodness of himself, itemizing his litany of personal qualities, and he has a lot according to him, in which he is perfect in every way. While listening to his recital of virtue is all that his activity centers on, we get to understand he's got some missing spots he needs to pay attention to. Because everything is in the I statement. He is blameless in his own eyes as he enters into this description of himself, but he exposes himself, as Jesus shows, for the exact opposite. He claims not to be greedy, but he glances at others only to demean them while maintaining his position at the, as the center of his concern. And I just need to tell you, it's really hard when I'm doing this part to make eye contact with any of you because I don't want you to take this on and I'm not looking at you for <laughs> any personal reason. But he does this. He claims to be honest, yet he was not even honest enough with himself to be aware of his own weaknesses. He thanks God that he's not like the others, the adulterer. But in covenant terms, his self-worship expresses the very idolatry that the ancient Hebrew prophets traditionally labeled as Israel's prostitution. He tells us that he observes the letter of the law for fasting and tithing, but he misses the point that fasting orients us to help put ourselves in touch with our need to serve. And tithing does the same. It leads us to care for others. 
Archie offers the world nothing by which he can positively be remembered. Jesus describes Archie's counterpart as the tax man. I've often thought this should be the sermon just before tax day, but it never falls in that part of the year. This poor fellow, let's call him Zach, assigns himself a place on the outer edge of the sanctuary. He sits as far away from anyone in the shadows with his head to the ground. His simple prayer is nothing more than admission of his own sins and a plea for God to please be merciful to him. It seems Zach doesn't care what he looks like as he prays. He comes before God simply as Zach, just like he is, just as he is. And he begs for God's mercy. And he tells God he's ready to accept it. His plea demonstrates his desire to move beyond selfishness. His honesty is about his weaknesses, all his shortcomings, as he looks to God to save him from himself. Thank you, God, for Zach. What would narcissistic Archie say if someone points out that humble Zach actually fulfilled what Archie had claimed in his phony prayer to God? Jesus' parable explains God's preferential option for the humble, for the thankful. Only those who know their need for God will pray in a way that God can answer. Truthfully, God loves us all. Mark tells us that every week. If you haven't paid attention to Mark Williams, he showers God's love on us in the name of all that is good. Thank you, Mark, for doing that. God loves us all, Mark, but, but God would really like it if some of us would be more like Zach, right? God still loves us all. When we hear this, we come to understand in Zach what humility and thankfulness looks like and what gratitude and living with a heart of gratitude looks like. Over the last Sunday, Greg Halby shared with us a very powerful testimony in which he opened himself up to us. Like Zach in this story, he spoke from his heart. And then Chris Glaros did this for us in First Reflections and we'll share again today. And Marty Wirth offered from her heart to us what it's like to try and walk this way. And again, like Zach, they spoke and right from the heart. Each has woven strands together in our church's tapestry of love and grace. They have shared why they came here, what keeps them coming back. And even in the toughest times here or in their own personal lives, it's the love of this family of faith that holds them in their spiritual home. Thank you, Greg and Chris and Marty, for sharing and opening yourselves up to us you are stewards of the gift God has given you, and we're grateful for the ways in which you seek to live and give with gratitude. Like other, uh, like our witnessing stewards and like Zach in Jesus' story today, each one of us is called to be humble as a steward of the gifts that God has given us. We are each called to live and give with gratitude and humility. The truth is stewardship is all about giving to God, it's about humbly turning over control of our lives to God. It's about prayerful and thoughtful attitude of sharing in which others know the benefits because you've lived that into your way of being with them. It's about joyful sharing, about time, talent, treasures. And stewardship is all about life. It's everything relates to stewardship in life. It's about living lovingly and thoughtfully in relation to the earth, all creatures and all people. It's about conserving water, recycling paper and aluminum, preserving wetlands and rainforests, rivers and table and water tables. It's about exercising, eating right, sleeping right, managing stress, nurturing our relationships and marriages, raising happy and healthy children, 
It's about caring for aging parents and friends, as well as caring for the poor and the oppressed of our city and our state and our nation and world. Stewardship is all of that and more. It's about sharing and living into the life that God has given us. All of these things make us alive and make us stewards. Just like life itself, stewardship is never an accident. We don't stumble into stewardship. It just doesn't work that way. We don't show up one day and say, now I'm a steward, and now I'll turn everything around, right? We have to work at it. We work at it each day, each prayer, each step, each way we turn and look, each way we uh, offer our hand to another. All of these things are not accidents. They're purposeful. People who live and give with gratitude are endlessly grateful. They give with a heart that shows no judgment, that doesn't focus on themselves or their gift, but simply on the extravagant joy of giving. Let's call this gratitude giving. Gratitude giving is worshipful, it's systematic, it's proportional, it's planned, it's joyful and sacrificial. It reflects the entire being of the giver, demonstrates that person's total involvement in the community, in their family, in their vibrancy of faith, in their exceptional commitment and trust of God. Gratitude giving is a witness to God's gospel of love. And over time, it becomes second nature, but it, it's not by accident. It's learned and practiced. And remember, no pressure, but all of this is done cheerfully. <laughs> so just when you think, oh man. I was telling at the early service that some years ago, um, and some of you have heard me tell this story, Harvey Cox of Harvard University was at a, a conference, an interfaith conference, and a Buddhist came up to Harvey and said, Harvey, there's something I do not understand. He said, I have never seen a people of faith frown so much as Christians. He said, you literally have frown lines on your heads. You seem to scour when you talk about your love of Jesus. He said, what is wrong with you? You have like the best savior in the world, right? He is joyful, he dances into life, he shows us how to be. Nothing about that causes me to frown. And Harvey said, with his face sort of scrunched up, you're right, my friend. <laughs> We're called to live into the fullness of this, this joy that we feel in the gospel, this joy that we feel with one another. It's really, it comes from inside, but it shows outside. It's become second nature for us. So we're in this time when we're considering what we'll do. But in all of this, remember to be joyful. Remember to smile. Remember to uh, be more like Zach as you step into this day and into your life. Be humble, be prayerful, be thoughtful, be grateful, be generous. And may your life be a testimony of faith lived out in joyful gratitude. May your giving reflect all the blessings you've received from God and that you've lived with in your life, and may it result in unending gratefulness. Amen.